Okay. One minute after four here in Brussels. Hello, welcome to everyone. Good day, wherever you're joining us from. I'm Mathilde gaston -Maté. I'm the Director of Communications for DRI's European Business Unit. And I'm really happy to welcome you to this last session of DEI and ECDPM joint webinar series, at least for 2021. Over the past few months, we have explored uh, the effects of the pandemic on the EU agenda for global development. And since this is the last webinar of the series, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the great speakers who contributed to the webinars. We were really lucky to bring around the table for each session a remarkable mix of specialists from all across the development ecosystem and from different parts of the world and bring them to reflect on development policies and trends, also through practical examples and their contributions made the success of this webinar series. And it's been quite a, a, a few, uh, a busy few months uh, since the summer with many events and in particular digital events competing with one another. So I wanted to thank our partner, the European Centre for Development Policy Management, and my DEI colleagues who helped to promote this series, as well as our media partner, Euractive, who helped us to stand out in the crowd. Over the past few months, we addressed the issues of COVID-19 and a number of topics, including sustainable agriculture value chain, digital financial inclusion, uh, economic recovery in fragile countries, and gender lens investing. And we will close today with a session on development finance. I want to tell, tell you that all sessions were recorded, and so is this one, by the way, and they remain available on, the, on DAI's and ECDPM's website. So in case you were busy with other webinars at the time, don't hesitate to watch the recordings. Today's session is in the hands of San Bilal. San is a talented moderator, and he's also extremely knowledgeable when it comes to development finance, as he leads the trade, investment, and finance program at ECDPM. And he was also our accomplice in the setting up of this joint DEI ECDPM webinar series, so I want to thank him today for his time coordinating and liaising with his fellow colleagues and preparing his own sessions because uh, San doesn't have a lot of time. So I've come to, know, come to know that once you manage to have him on hand, you'd better make the most of him. And I'm sure that's what our speakers and new participants will do today. Before I leave the floor to you, San, I wanted to point out that we had two unfortunate cancellations, uh, which is why you might have noticed some changes in our various communications and list of speakers for today's uh, webinar. Fulvio, Fulvio Capurso from DigiNear unfortunately had to cancel his participation for personal reasons. And we are grateful that he immediately connected us with his colleague, uh, Lucas Veseli, who's here today. And Franny Leotier from Southbridge Investments uh, had last minute business obligations and sent her, sends her apologies. And she's replaced by Valeria Ramundo Orlando. So thank you both for accepting to join us today. And um, Yes, without further ado, I will now pass the floor to you, San. Thanks for joining and enjoy, enjoy this session. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mathilde, also for your kind uh, words. And, and I think you were saying we're standing out of the, the crowds, but I think it's because of the uh, fantastic uh, panel members that uh, we have and, and, and discussion that uh, help us to stand uh, out of the crowds. And, uh, uh, today, this is really going to be uh, the case, and so I really would like to to thank you uh, all, and and of course in particular, uh, Lucas Vesely, who very kindly uh, jump in uh, from the engineer, and uh, Valeria Ramondo Orlando, uh, who has been was also an extremely busy schedule, and she will have to leave us uh, in 55 minutes for another business meeting, uh, but she very kindly accepted to to join us. The the purpose of the discussion today, and uh, you know, Matilda mentioned that I've been quite busy at ACDPM. We have been, of course, following development uh, corporations and how to, to to support our countries in their transformation. And, and finance is a very important uh, dimension uh, that is talked about much more these days than it was, uh, I would say, a few years ago. And in particular, thinking of finance beyond uh, beyond aid. 
uh, and and the role of uh, you know mobilizing private finance for for developments. I think finally the development cooperation world is, is realizing how important uh, this is. But at the same time, then talking to a range of stakeholders, and I've been involved with discussions, in fact, with a panelist and, and, and some of their colleagues. Sometimes I have the feeling we're speaking slightly at cross purposes. That the other private uh, sector people who have their own language, their own uh, approaches. Then you have the, I would say, the development uh, worlds that uh, that has a, a, another approach with the DFIs and MDBs and public development banks coming about, you know, trying to bridge these these two worlds. Uh, and then we have the more traditional, perhaps, development cooperation. And, and sometimes, in spite of the goodwill to, to work uh, together, I have the feeling that some of the, you know, when the agenda are, are sometimes part, partly coming together, the actions are not necessarily always uh, doing the case. We still uh, sometimes trap, I have the feeling, in, in some old modes of interventions where the, each one is doing its own activities uh, and, and not sufficiently in synergy. So today uh, we have gathered people who are all focused on trying to make that bridge and, and to try to make that connection. And so we wanted to, to try to see from their perspective uh, how to, to work better together uh, in order to try to stimulate uh, uh, developments and, and and sustainable transformation, and so I wanted to start with with Valeria uh, Ramon de Olondo, who is the partner and co-founder of Green Square uh, Green Square uh, Ventures, and and we also work together, Valeria, on the uh, as a coordination group of the uh, OECD THK blended uh, platform and finance platform. So we had a lot of opportunities to exchange, also quite informally, and from you, private sector. Perspectives and private finances. Perspectives. What do you see some key challenges that uh, you encounter trying to form developing countries? Thank you, Sam, and it's an absolute pleasure to <clears throat> uh, to be here with everybody. Um, we work primarily in emerging and frontier markets, and this is probably how we start distinguishing the language that we use. Um, from the private perspective towards instead the more traditional development finance. And uh, what we do is uh, we support the structuring of financial products. But our ma main goal as a company is that to really support sovereigns and corporates to build capital markets um, in emerging and frontier markets. And what that means is starting to look at how one can use local currency um, for new issuances to support new products to support debt, but as well as also equity participation at a smaller level. But to make this in a, um, in a more simple, uh, language is what we try to create is look at where opportunities lie in terms of both SMEs and SMEs and larger corps, bring them together so that we can create an aggregation of funds to create volume. Because as Sun asked me is, what are the basic challenges that we face every day is, <clears throat> apologies, it's um, volume is one of them, uh, which means the products that are available are too small for investors to come in. We also find a lot of the investors that are local looking abroad uh, because of there is a perception of risk in investing in local currency, political risk or insurance risks, epic risks. And then you have an issue with credit, the credit worthiness of the product or the company. And many times you have companies and you have also sovereign nations that actually have great potential, uh, but because they've relied for so long on grant mechanisms and as well as they've relied on um, uh, funding uh, that is not in the market, they've had faces, they are facing today issues with not having any credit. And before I run out of my time, we're also looking at time, experience, and lack of capacity. Thank you, Sam. Well, thanks. Ed. We'll start with the round with the panel members, and then it's really the purpose is really to have a discussion. So don't worry, we'll have time to to get back. But you already in very few sentences highlighted a lot of. Uh, of issues and so uh, then we, we're very lucky to have uh, uh, 
uh, Maya Shobagan, who is the director of leading uh, of lending in Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, Asia, and Latin America. Um, so basically, outside the EU, uh, uh, almost all the countries uh, at the European Investment Bank. Uh, and we also have uh, opportunities to, to discuss quite often about what you can be doing. What do you see as the perhaps, you know, I'm not asking you to describe the role of the EIB, but how do you think you can best try to play this role of combining and, and, and bridging these private sector perspectives with the perhaps more traditional donors type of uh, approaches? Thanks, thank you. Thank you very much, San. And it's really an honor to be part of this panel. And now that I have listened to Valeria, there's so many things we need to discuss. No, it was really, you really touched on capital markets, local currency, volume, aggregation, you know, uh, private sector, everything was there. So uh, let me, uh, San, to respond to your question. Where I do think we have a role is in mobilizing finance. And I really liked the, the title of this, of this session today about building back better. And we now have an opportunity that this, the crisis and the economic crisis out of the pandemic has been really devastating, but it has also showed that there's a number of things we need to fix. And that's why the building back better is essential. It has to be greener, sustainable, and sustainable is much more than green. It has to be inclusive, and we need to have resilience in economies, resilience in developing countries. And this not only as pandemic preparedness, but resilience from a climate uh, adaptation point of view, resilience of the economies. And in all of this is where we need the full involvement of the private sector and where development banks like the European Investment Bank can contribute. But we will not make it happen. We can only be one of the elements that brings others together and that we work towards this resilience. So that's what I hope we can discuss today. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Maria. I have many questions for you, but let me turn uh, first to uh, Luca Vizzelli, because uh, you are the team leader on blending and uh, EIB relations at the Europe, at the DGNIA, the European Commission, uh, so dealing with the neighbourhoods, and, and on purpose, in fact, you are not dealing with the areas that Maria uh, are covering. That, that is on purpose that we, we invited to make sure we have the broad coverage. Um, uh, of, of what the EU is doing, but can you tell us, uh, and in particular, perhaps with the team, team Europe approach, uh, how, you know, what is the the basic principles and approach of what the Commission is is trying to do, and perhaps things that you have been doing at Digineer for, for quite some time already. Thank you very much, San. Hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, Valeria and uh, colleagues. Indeed, I'm covering the countries that Maria is not covering. So I'm covering the, the, the Western Balkans, Turkey, the Eastern neighborhood, and the Southern neighborhood. So the, what we call what we call near near uh, areas. What we the, what the European Commission is is on the brink of launching is a is a big uh, big suite of instruments that we call the European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus. And this is this is this is a full suite of instruments uh, ranging from technical assistance grants to some investment grants, but uh, but especially uh, a significantly scale up guarantee capacity, in order to to be able to guarantee some public sector, some some lending for public sector investments infrastructure, but but also also private sector development, uh, access to finance and and. Uh, your private sector development uh, programs. We we have been testing such instruments, including the guarantee instruments, for a long time. But but what we are what we are about to launch uh, in this new decade is will be a, at a significantly larger larger scale. So the, the guarantee capacity that we will be using under the EFSD plus will be about 40 billion. Large part of it will be uh, implemented through the European Investment Bank, as Maria knows very well. But but we we work also with with a range of other implementing partners, such as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and many many development finance institutions of individual EU member states. So the Italian, Polish, Spanish, Swedish, German, French, Dutch, uh, and other banks. We are trying to to use this range of partners, and through them, also to reach out to to 
private private uh, financial institutions with uh, development of impact focused funds we have we try to mobilize and crowd in uh, investors very much for the for investments that 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 uh, would take all the, all the quality aspirations that maria has named uh, greener sustainable inclusive resilient and if i can just mention uh, a small thing which we will probably return the commission recently recently published a big ambitious agenda for connectivity the so-called global gateway strategy which articulates also a lot, a lot of these kind of quality standards uh, that we would expect to for financial support okay thank you very much that's for the the overall picture and and perhaps uh, you know to see how it lands on uh, on on the ground and in, in, in very practical uh, terms we have also the the chance of having uh, Ken Oitana who, who is a, a consultant uh, who is providing a lot of uh, uh, technical assistance at the local level and uh, you are currently working uh, on women's entrepreneurship uh, development project can you tell us what do you see from you know from the, uh, the ground um, and practical angle? What are some of the challenges that you you see in terms of uh, uh, supporting the developments? You are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sam, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, to share our experience on the ground. Uh, in fact, here we, we have our role uh, on this project is to provide technical assistance to the fund manager um, and then the participating financial institutions on the ground so that they will be able to use the, the development fund is coming or flowing into this country uh, on an efficient and effective manner. Uh, and we believe that uh, the fact that the funding is available does not make uh, that it will be it's going to be effective unless it is uh, complemented by capacity building of all partners engaging there, including how the fund is managed at, at the country level, and then also at the at the at the level of implementing financial institutions. Uh, and we had an experience of different development of the final funding coming to these partners. But only a few of them are uh, successful and the, the successful ones are those uh, supported by uh, effective, uh, I mean, technical um, capacity building, which is tailored to their needs. It does not mean that we are going to offer a kind of uh, a generic type of technical assistance, but we are going to provide a tailor-made technical assistance by by digging out what the constraints at the at the institution levels, because capacity is really very important in reaching out to the the, the target markets of micro, small, and medium enterprises. And we are trying to bridge uh, the gap there so that the, the, the financial institutions will be reaching out to micro, small, and medium enterprises in an impactful manner by providing a, a responsive type of financial products that will particularly meet the need of uh, those, those micro, uh, small, and medium enterprises with a special uh, focus on women entrepreneurs. So that's basically what we are doing. And maybe you can have a discussion on that more later on. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. In, in fact, this is perhaps a, a good entry point to, to open up the more generally the, the discussion. I mean, there is finance that is provided uh, by, uh, you know, through different channels, but uh, private sector don't have the, the means, the finance to provide this technical assistance, uh, you know, just by themselves. This is something costly. Most DFI do not provide uh, technical assistance, so the EIB is able to provide some, but Maria, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think even the your means to provide technical assistance have been reduced going forward and are not necessarily increasing. So uh, how do we combine in practice this provision of technical assistance with the finance? Who wants to address this question? Maria, you want to tell us how you do it at the EIB level? I'm, I'm very happy to, to come in. Uh, so going forward, um, just to answer to your specific question, going forward, we will not have the same sources of funds for technical assistance that we had in the past, but we will be having access to blending of funds with the European Commission. So we do have a number of donors. The main one is clearly the European Commission, and we will have 
uh, capacity to provide technical assistance. And technical assistance, we are convinced, is essential in the great majority of the projects that we are supporting. You need to do technical assistance, and the, the example of Keno is, is fantastic. Whenever we are working with loans for small and medium-sized enterprises or for microfinance to the institutions so that they are well equipped to achieve the goals, but also sometimes you even need to provide technical assistance to the final beneficiaries. We have lines of technical assistance for women entrepreneurs so that they can prepare their business plans to present them to the institutions so that they will lend to, to them. So the, there it's essential. It's essential whenever you're trying to do more green investments. It is essential when you're trying to do infrastructure that is adapted to climate change. This is a new risk and everybody needs to be better equipped to analyze climate risks. So technical assistance is a, 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 a you know, crucial element. And I'll, and I'll finish with this. We, the EIB, we say we do lending, but also blending and advising. And it's the combination of the three that can provide this more integrated approach that is needed every time. So okay, but technical assistance is are... crucial. Okay, but when you ask uh, Maria to to do more, I, I mean not not yourself, but I mean as the EIB, you are you are asked to to do more, and uh, you know you were saying to build back better, but also with the uh, EFSD, they, there is this requirement to have a greater impact and to do more. But at the same time, you know the council conclusions uh, last June have said uh, you should have a greater presence on the ground, but everything should be done at con constant costs and not at increasing costs. So how can you provide more advice and how can you, you know, uh, I would say, use your expertise not only to do deals for yourself and, and that are profit making as a bank, but to, to share this advice and build the capacity of the uh, entities with whom you work when you have to do that at constant cost. Is that something possible or is there not some kind of you know, you catch 22 requests that is made to the EIB. Do more, but with no more means and try to provide more supports. What are the incentives? Yeah, we're being asked to do more impact, not to do more volume, huh? just to be, to be clear. And it is very evident that to do more impact, we need access to technical assistance. And often, what is very important as well is that we work closely with the EU delegations so that the policy work that the delegations are doing is aligned or that we align with the policy work that delegations are doing so that we are working in the same direction. And, you know, let me give another very specific example. If we're talking about the digital sector, in the digital sector, it's important to make the investments. So the, the, there's going to be need for infrastructure, need for equity into startups and things like this. But what is also essential is that there is the regulatory system that data protection is done properly, that there is a proper cybersecurity systems in the countries. And for this, the EIB can mobilize grants from the Commission to provide technical assistance, but the EU delegations are also already doing a lot. So it's wherever we are working in the sector that we concentrate our efforts, what the delegations are doing, what the EIB can do, and what other financiers, European development finance institutions, the bilaterals can do so that we are all working in the same direction. That's how we can achieve together more impact. And that's where we should be working. Thank you, Valeria. I saw you, you were reacting. Well, I really enjoy listening to Maria, actually. I think I could sit here and listen to her the whole day, but I have a, a... I am known I love my bilateral meeting. meetings. <laughs> yes, uh, no, but most of that, uh, I think I like to challenge a bit um, all of the institutions present because I think that San actually invited me for that reason. Uh, that's what I'm known for to be a little bit um, to move things in the way that we think. Um, I grew up in Africa, so I grew up in an LDC, um, but something that San doesn't know has actually worked uh, for the MEDA teams, which was one of the programs of technical assistance that the EU created in the 90s for North Africa. Um, and now I'm going to use that experience um, to just challenge on the way that we've been thinking about development finance. 
what if the technical assistance starts becoming a common platform that is, for example, owned by the EIB or owned by the commission? Um, what, it, what I mean is that, you know, a lot of us have been building ESG platforms, for example, recently, and currently the EU taxonomy is offering a great opportunity to have really a checklist of um, investment opportunities and as well as a checklist of what is sustainable, what isn't sustainable, what is good and what should not be done. And that can be very supportive, for example, um, to have assistance from, let's say, Brussels, and this is completely uh, a bit of a challenge. And instead of just saying we give grants or we provide technical assistance to build technical assistance in country, what if the platform stays in Brussels and then supports the in-country missions to execute some of this work, but the knowledge stays within a larger platform that then can do the same work, whether in South America, in Africa, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Southeast Asia, or wherever that mission takes you. Uh, but it is one, it saves money. Two, you have lessons learned of constantly. Uh, and I also know the challenges of doing that, by the way, internally, I worked for a multilateral for 10 years, but the issue is if one starts not, uh, not making it too central, but there are experiences for building resilience, for building sustainability that are common. We work from the Caribbean to Southeast Asia, including lots of countries in Africa, and it's not that we have a massive team. We, we have certain experiences when it looks at green, social, sustainability, healthcare, education, gender, and so on, uh, and their best practices. And then we adapt them to the local experience, which can be done by the European missions, of course. And the last thing, always to be slightly controversial, I know I'm recording and this is going to be public, I think that it could be interesting to start looking at the private equity model. And I know a lot of people's hair is probably raising, but the reason I'm saying that is private equity always works when money is short, meaning when there's not much money to invest, they have to figure out how to go in, how to support management, how, and I'm not talking about the, the private equity that is destructive, but the ones that actually are building stronger companies. And if you start thinking of how do I make 10 go as much as 80, that's a model that there is enough historical background that if we start changing the way that we perceive and that we approach uh, customers and sovereigns by saying, let's empower you to make your own decisions, I think you're going to see a lot of change. And um, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Valeria. A, a, a lot to chew on. Uh, let me turn to Keno. I, I wanted to. <laughs> I had Lucas on my mind, but uh, let me first turn to to Keno because you do provide uh, technical assistance, and uh, I, I like uh, to to engage with Valeria because. You know, I was I was wondering if that is not a bit old fashioned to have a center where you have all the knowledge and the expertise and then you dispatch it around the world and you say here you need to solve a, a problem. Isn't it an approach on the contrary needed to be totally different to say you need to build and, and to contribute or to accompany? You don't need to build. You need to accompany the knowledge generation from within the countries and try to, to to do that. And so on the contrary, instead of having this central pool, shouldn't you have, you know, a more much more decentralized approach and also learning from the specificities and the approaches that are done at the local level and use technical assistance from the local uh, from the local experts that could team up with the international ones. But is that not a way that is more transformative than come and go type of mission uh, would we have seen uh, international institutions and donors do for, for decades? Keno, now you have two options you can choose, Valeria or me. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Just for the sake of argument. I think I choose you <laughs> because based on my experience, actually, uh, you know, I am of the opinion that um, capacity building need to be sustainable, right? The EIB or the other fund, the funders will not always be there to fund all capacity building is in different developing countries. And at some point, this capacity should be transferred to the local uh, people 
and we need to be find a mechanism to to build a local source of knowledge that stays within the countries uh, so that it will be more sustainable because uh, uh, this if, if it is going to stay centrally so it means that if you don't have for instance the capacity building budgets it's going the knowledge is going to stay there and the local countries the local people do not have any source of uh, knowledge that they can tap into so I would rather prefer that if we can build a system where we can in fact establish a local uh, tea support units in these different countries where we, we create local um, sorry when we where we create local consultants local companies that can sustainably provide technical assistance for the financial institutions on paid based on fee basis actually because you cannot continue funding this forever also at some point this capacity building support should change into a paid form of um, support or um, services so so that so once we we showcase the need for capacity building for instance if we, once we showcase that an mfi needs capacity building in abcde and then we show how it can actually transform some of the things some of the processes some of the systems that the way they, they perform and then now they are convinced so they should be able to uh, be able to uh, procure those kind of services from their own funding so that's the I think where we should be heading instead of creating a kind of a centralized uh, capacity building unit where we can we can channel it from different countries so that is my opinion and in fact from my previous experience we have also tried doing that where we've uh, for instance worked on creating a certified kind of consultants in in, 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 in the country and link it to them with MFIs or other financial institutions so that they can have a one-to-one -one relationship uh, apart from the capacity building program because that's ultimately what we are aiming for what we are aiming for is to create a, a stronger financial institutions who can continue serving the msmes with or without funding coming from the external sources thank you sir can i come in on this up uh, can or in, it, in fact, it's probably i'm not sure you need to choose between the two models probably they can coexist uh together yeah you wanted to 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 come in yeah so i i do i do i i'm precisely that's what i was going to go towards because i did like very much from what valeria uh, presented the idea of a platform the idea of not having to every time start from scratch and going into each uh, country or each each one of the beneficiaries and trying to design a, a whole technical assistance program for them. There are things that can uh, that, that 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 are to be deployed in many places at the same time. And let me give a very specific example: green bonds. We all know that green bonds make a lot of sense, and we also see that green bonds tend to be issued in the north and bought in the north. We need to break this and have many more green bonds issued by developing countries and emerging countries and having those bought ideally also in the north but also by the the pension funds and institutional investors from the south that have a lot of liquidity but do not have the right assets to invest into so for green bonds and here we're talking about something that needs to be high quality and standardized there it makes sense to have a platform that can deliver this technical assistance but then of course the technical assistance and the capacity building, and this Keno was, uh, Keno was absolutely right, it has to create the knowledge locally and that it stays. And ideally on green bonds, you do, you send the consultant, the consultant helps, helps the issuer to issue green bonds once. Second issuance, they, have to, they can do it on their own. But the first time, everybody needs help. And that help that is aligned with international standards makes sense to do from a platform. And that's why I think both ideas, at least in some of the cases, is probably the best of the, the best way to deliver, to maximize the impact and to achieve scale and take from 10 to 80 that would otherwise cost to achieve the same outcome. Thank you very much, um, Maria. That's uh, was, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sometimes just provocative. So, Valeria, sorry, I was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I was on purpose trying to challenge to, to, to trigger reaction, but uh, indeed the world is 
quite often more complex. It's not one single solution. Uh, uh, and there's uh, perhaps needs for mix of both. But Lucas, if, I mean, the idea of the external investment plan at, at the EU level was exactly to try to coordinate this approach between blended finance guarantees with the first pillar, the second pillar, the technical assistance, and the third pillar is this policy dialogue. On paper, and I've written a lot about it and praised it a lot, it's fantastic. But in practice, if we're really honest, where are we on this connection? Where is the connection between what we're talking about, you know, stimulating finance and the capacity to mobilize uh, uh, capacity building and technical assistance and to have synergies between the different elements? Even in the current programming process now, are we able to, at the same time, identify what are the investment needs and to already uh, put aside some of the uh, uh, corresponding uh, capacity building and technical assistance and other donors interactions that's, that could accompany and, and complement uh, these kind of investments? How, how do we master the grand design? Nice question. So, uh, well, the, the grand design is being being, being <laughs> rolled out as, as we speak. Um, the, the, the external investment plan, when it was launched in 2017, then the, then a number of guarantee agreements were signed in the, in the subsequent years. Uh, they are they are being put in place. In the meantime, COVID happened, so so we ended up using some of the guarantee capacity for with, with the EAB's help uh, for the Covax scheme. Uh, but uh, but. Uh, Look, I think I think the the kind of co contrast that was presented here be between build, building expertise centrally or, or or building sustainable local knowledge, uh, I think we, we have already arrived at the synthesis of that. Every inst just like the EU itself has headquarters and then it has delegations, the EIB has headquarters where, where let's say exper uh, expertise and and good practices uh, and insights are are accumulated and then they can be then replicated. The, the good examples they can be replicated in many different countries. So all all the partner institutions the, the, that we are working with have um, I think play play this role that uh, that the that the relevant relevant lessons can then be replicated from country to country. But I would I would very much agree with with uh, with Keno's point that uh, that uh, we def we do do aim to to strengthen the capacities locally and to not not to, not to just just hold them them in in Brussels. Um, in the meantime the. The union is adopting the so-called multi-annual indicative programs for for the various regions and countries. So this is what we call the programming, basically a multi-year planning document that matches resources, money with objectives. How much money is roughly going to be spent for 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 which objective? And the novelty this this time around is precisely that we that we try to to have an overall view not only of what we are going to do with grant money. For example, to, to to support development NGOs, but also how we are going to use blending, and and guarantees in partnership with the various development banks, for uh, for investments. So so this time around, we try to 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 program this in 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 one big picture, and uh, and there are there are detailed detailed uh, investment agendas for the for the individual countries or sometimes at, at the regional level, they are they are being put in place now. But how do you connect the two? I mean, I, I mean, you can identify and 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 the you know that's the the approach to say okay, we are going. What are you planning to do in, in terms of investment in that country, and what what are the priorities? I mean, the thematic priorities, and then you identify what we're doing with grants, what we're doing with the FSD, and so. My question is how in practice, and I'm, I'm not <laughs> expecting you to have necessarily the whole view, but. If all of you could have some suggestions on how, in practice, do you connect these kind of approaches with the different instruments and ensure that it doesn't become simply a donor's type of exercise, but responds to the local needs and to the needs of the private uh, uh, private investors? I mean, I'll, I'll turn then to Valeria to ask, okay, but how, how do you... You know, can you follow the maze of the number of donors that are out there and the number of different initiatives? At the end of the day, which is the private sector that can manage to engage and understand how, uh, you know, how, how to navigate all this? So, 
uh, even as a donor or as a you know development actor and policy actor, how do you do this coordination between your different instruments? Oh, for, for so, hi. Key, sorry, no, oh. just, just 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 to respond very briefly. Yeah. The the key for me is in the good communication between the headquarters and 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 the, and the individual delegation, so the people on the ground. So so the the the, the person representing the EU in in Armenia or in Togo needs needs to have a good picture of. Or the whole the whole office there needs to have a good picture of all the instruments that we have. That's that's what that's what we are trying to to build up. So that when then a good good uh, application is put forward by by Keno or his cousin uh, in, in colleague in in a, in a different country, the good application then comes. We are we are able to see how how best this this, this can be supported. So. That, that, that's the key, the, and that's, that's what we are really trying to do this time around. Not 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 to have some instruments, kind of uh, conceived in in the ivory tower of the headquarters, but we really we really try to to integrate them into the programming of the of the of the EU external action country by country, region by region, to have them to have them available and to have them deployed uh, everywhere. Okay. No problem. No, I think we have some uh, background uh, noise by people. Somebody yeah, yeah. wants to in intervene. Eh? They want to say something on this. Yes, yes, we will open in. Uh, 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 please uh, uh, raise uh, your your questions and chat in 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 five minutes. We will open uh, for 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 the you know general uh, questions. I wanted to get back to uh, an intervention, but to Valeria in terms of. I, I mean, first on on this question of uh, which I. Just present them, you know, how from a private sector do you manage the maze of different actors that are out there? And the second, perhaps, if you would have suggestions on the scaling uh, type of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, perspectives, how can we do things and, and perhaps empower? I think it was in, 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 in an article in DevEx, <laughs> I think it's this week. Where, where there was a, a, a private sector person saying, well, you know, we should let, we should, the commission and, and the donors in general should support more the innovations coming from the private sector and not try to, 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 to have everything programmed and, and, and supported. So from your perspective, without getting into the specifics of, of this article, but uh, uh, Valeria, how do you see, you know, what is the kind of, uh, engagement you would uh, expect from from donors and from DFIs to try to rather promote and encourage your and, and nurture the innovative aspects of the private sector rather than uh, I think I heard you in all the context saying sometimes there is explicit uh, crowding out of the uh, private sector. Thank you. Um, so a few things uh and uh, to be honest i'm sorry that i probably did not explain myself about the centralization um i think that we need to uh first and foremost one of the things that the eu has just issued which is the eu taxonomy is going to um allow investors to um evaluate and evaluate their investments more clearly according to a checklist now, the ability for any country or any corporate or any sovereign that is not Western to decipher the EU taxonomy and click all those boxes is going to be extremely hard. And that means that uh, the EU has just issued something that is going to create a greater divide if it doesn't provide IE technical assistance to understand how to check all the boxes of the EU taxonomy, because the EU taxonomy is something that will impact every single investor uh, and their portfolio. So that's something to think about. Now, how do we uh, manage the maze of donors and DFIs? That's very interesting because DFIs in the last 15 years have been crowding in uh, and distorting markets. How? Well, they have been providing concessional funding uh, to extremely good investment opportunities who couldn't go to market because the funding that they were being provided with by the EU or many other DFIs in the world um, was so advantageous that it made no sense for them to be empowered to seek debt or seek, for example, the issuance of a green bond. Going back to Maria on the green bond, uh, you need a centralized platform to support countries 
in issuing sustainable bonds. Uh, and it cannot be technical assistance one country by one country because there's no more of that money. And the largest amount of countries in the world fall under the category of emerging or frontier markets. Actually, the largest amount of countries in the world fall under frontier markets, which means they have no capital markets, they have no rating. They are uninvestable, quote unquote, quote, until we actually support them to be able to rise above and be empowered. I'm not against building capacity on the ground. We always team up with companies on the ground to understand what the need is on the ground and customize it. But to issue a bond, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros. That level of engagement needs to be centralized so that that funding can be provided for free to those who want to issue sustainable products. By the moment that you issue that, that you support them in expertise, as Maria said, you're building expertise on the ground because all it takes is one issuance and then everybody learns. But one issuance with bringing financial institutions that are local as lead managers, as underwriters on the ground. That's how you build capacity on the ground. The other thing is, I apologies if I'm taking too long, is what are the issues really with fine. investors? Investors are now facing restrictions. The EU taxonomy is one restriction. There are new policies on climate and how you can uh, structure your portfolio and when it's going to be positive or negative. You have ESG platforms that determine what type of investments you can make. So today investors are looking at what are the new business line, but what are they ranked as? So now emerging markets and frontier markets are not only dealing with their credit ratings, with the huge per risk perception that is creating a, let's call the risk premium for Africa, Latin America, Caribbean, and especially, and this is what shocked me two years ago, the risk premium that us as European are putting on Eastern Europe. How is it possible, and sorry, I'm gonna call up one nation, but how is it possible that Lithuania is a frontier market? That is risk perception. They have advanced innovation. They have young people who are investing in tech. They're creating and building companies and there's no recognition of that from local investors and from European investors. So we really need to shift our perception. We need to start looking at the perception differently. And I think that the FIs and donors coming together, aggregating, creating a platform to support globally, all countries to issue sustainable securities or sustainable financial products. I think that's an answer and you will have the investors coming in because they're just looking at not being crowded out of the market, but they're looking for the same opportunities that right now a lot of the DFIs are able to reach uh, and are taking off the market. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. Uh, <laughs> these are a lot of uh, interesting points. Maria, I'm surprised not to see you waving and, <laughs> and, and no, trying no, no, to... I... I, I was just thinking it really, you know, I, I agree with much of what Valeria has said. The reality is supporting more issuance of green bonds. It's really a winning strategy. It makes sense. It will bring more investors and different investors to, to this market. It will bring more funds to these countries and it ensures, because we're talking always about quality green bonds, it ensures that more green investments, climate relevant investments are happening. So it is really an area that I think is a, a no brainer. And I hope that in a few years time, we look back and we will see that on this topic in particular, we will have made a difference. That's, that's what I was reflecting listening to, to Valeria. Very good. Let me turn to some of the questions that are, that are coming in. There's uh, Amadula Adam, who is asking, in fact, whether you know, when I was talking about the innovation of the private sector and so on, whether in fact this is not just money making driven and going against the people. Um, 
what are and we hear these kind of comments quite often i mean in, in a sense there's also an argument that perhaps trying to mobilize the private sector is waste of uh, uh, donors money and they should rather do things that the private sector would not do at all um, what would be your answer to to these kind of uh, remarks i think it's a, i think it's very unfair but somebody i think Ken wanted to come in i can come in later but just to say i think it's a very unfair remark Okay, but uh, the, the the question is perhaps less if it's fair or unfair, but uh, rather, you know, what is the answer to 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 the argument of to, to the legitimate worry in a sense? I mean, if let me put it in a different way, how do you ensure that uh, you know that by supporting some private sector and accompanying and providing technical assistance and so on, all the nice things you have been talking about, you're not simply subsidizing private uh, actors and uh, strengthening some monopolies or uh, you know, on your type of positions. Yeah, no, Lucas. No. Lucas, you wanted to come? Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Yeah. I think this is, is it, it is a good question. I mean, this is this is this is how we are trying to implement the, the, the guarantees that I was speaking about. So we have a lot of guarantee capacity um, at, our, at our disposal now for the coming years. And what we will be doing is that we will, we will be selecting um, proposed investment portfolios. This will be coming to us from the various development banks. And what we will be doing is, of course, ass assessing these, these uh, investment proposals on the basis of the, of the, of the expected uh, impact in, in economic, social, environmental terms, how to what extent these, these investments can, can help to achieve uh, our policy objectives. So it def definitely not, not, uh, not, not just, not just uh, relieving somebody of risk, uh, for, for, the, for the pleasure of it. And what is very important is that we are, for these budgetary guarantees, as we call them, we are actually charging a fee, but we are providing technical assistance funding on the side. So, so, so this is the model. So, so, it, and this, this, this is, this is uh, going to be our, our first, uh, first instrument of choice. Basically, with, 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 uh, with every good proposal that will be presented to, to us about, about uh, private sector development, uh, program wherever we will first think could we could we handle this by de-risking by reducing the risk by taking a share of the risk uh, for a fee and with technical assistance provision uh, coming alongside and then only only if really necessary and additionally we, we wouldn't we wouldn't be uh, throwing in some some grant funding on the side if you know if that is necessary to 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 make the program viable at first, in the first instance, we, we, we will try to support uh, investment programs through through guarantees. Good, very good. Valet, you wanted to come in on, on this? Uh, yeah, uh, gladly. Um, so what we do and many of our colleagues who are working in sustainability and ESG alignment, um, we are very aware and not only as ESG alignment, but a lot of times we also do SDG alignment. So recently we did a project with a uh, healthcare provider for low and middle income uh, in Africa. And the whole point of the S was to make sure that there were no negative externalities. So, so how do we take a reduction of mortality rates for communities? So that would not be a service that would create revenue for the bond issuer that was a healthcare provider, but it was a service that gave them credibility in terms of alignment to the SDGs and also gave them credibility to tick the S so that they could get an ESG quote unquote recognition certification. So I completely understand the question. Again, I, uh, I, I was raised and grew up in an LDC. So I'm very uh, connected with that community specifically. But the question here is to make sure that anything that is linked to sustainability, and I think the EU taxonomy will also help with that, is to truly look at negative externalities, making sure that by whatever investment you do and you're mobilizing the private sector, you're not creating a negative impact on even very small marginalized communities. So when you're looking at building sustainability, you're taking that in consideration. So let's say electric plant, uh, a renewable plant, uh, power plant of solar panels, if you are displacing communities to benefit 
an urban center with a larger people, that's a negative externalities and that should be avoided. So it's really a shift uh, from the private industry perspective and from the investor perspective. Because today we are faced with also looking at negative reputational capital. So we have to be able to say to our investors and investors in general saying, you're not gonna be faced with discriminating against a community or marginalizing people or displacing animals, which are actually a way of feeding those communities in many cases. So that is something that the private sector today is a lot more aware of than let's say five years ago or three years ago. Thanks a lot, Valeria. I know you have to go in four minutes. So let me just ask you another question before you go back to your normal business. Uh, you know, perhaps in, in the sense of, you were mentioning the scaling dimension. So what would you expect uh, as kind of perhaps instruments or, you know, since we have the EIB and the commission here, what, what are, and, and I know you work and, you know, much more internationally, so it doesn't have to be just restricted to the two of them, but what are the kind of initiatives you would think would be very helpful to help scaling? Um... Well, the, the idea behind the, a, a platform that then deploys the, is it's really scale. You need to aggregate in order to create volume. Currently, it's really hard without asking a sovereign or a corporate to over indebt themselves to issue or to be able to come out with a volume that is interesting to investors. But I also think that there is something that is very powerful that has not been brought up yet which is why don't we start looking at blending local investors that are retail investors with institutional or investors that are coming from the outside and the other portion of investment that we should start engaging is venture what does that mean is looking at how do i become a venture investor in impact in impact for development and why would I do that? Because there is a return, but there's also risk. But a venture investor has already that appetite for risk. And to this day, they haven't really been mobilized. So that is one target from the private sectors that we should start looking at mobilizing. And uh, when we're looking at scaling, we really need to aggregate because a lot of sovereigns, a lot of smaller companies, a lot of MSMEs, SMEs, if you are aggregating in the pool, they're able to be funded. And that also actually addresses the question of making sure we're not creating levels of inequality or distortion for communities. Why? Because the moment that there is an aggregation, now there is more funding available for those companies that would never be able to produce the volume and that would allow for scale. So you will get a greater amount of similar companies under an aggregation, but from different countries. And I am, by the way, just before I leave, I'm not always uh, in favor of centralization, but we feel that there is a certain level of knowledge that if it could be distributed equally among nations, it would create equality not inequality, meaning there will be a, a little cash going to many more countries than that little cash only going to one. So we're trying to really approach as many countries as possible right now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Valeria, and also for, for your time and, and, and for emphasizing the need for aggregation and to try to do, uh, I mean, to do things at the, at the bigger scale. Uh, I mean, small projects are, are important, but uh, if we really want to mobilize uh, uh, finance and, and, you know, build back better and, and in a very transformative way, we need to do that at scale. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria, and I wish you a good, <laughs> a good rest of the day for you. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps let me, there are some questions uh, and that, that you can also uh, also address in terms of, uh, there is one I'm trying to get clarification on, on ECDPM in Somalia and, and sustainable development. So I know I had some colleagues working on peace and, and, and security and stability in Somalia, but I'm not aware of 
uh, other works. I'm not so sure I understand the, the, the full question. Uh, if uh, Libana then uh, Mohammed wants to clarify in the chat, I'll be happy to uh, to address it. There, there is a question perhaps more generally is, uh, you know, from some of our participants is, uh, how do I finance, uh, how do I get access to these fantastic finance that is there? Well, what is, the, how do we know what is done? Uh, so there was a question, you know, for Mozambique or, uh, uh, there is a, a question for uh, our cultural uh, project uh, uh, in uh, in Liberia. Uh, you know, I, I have a nice initiative. I think, oh, I hear all these nice things that Europe is doing. Uh, how do we get access to that? And and perhaps Keno, uh, let me start with you. You have been silent also with it. How does it happen on the ground? You said you were su supporting. Uh, women entrepreneurs that, by the way, are normally the ones that have the most difficulties to get access to finance. Uh, we know there are a lot of uh, barriers for them, and yet it, we know it's an extremely profitable uh, business. It's absolutely essential to have uh, the development uh, and, and transformation that we want uh, to include women, and they are very effective at that. Uh, so I, one does not understand why it's not done more more systematically. But how do they, these women that you that you try to support, how do they know even that they can get some kind of uh, support for their businesses? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. So I would like also maybe to start from the role the the, the blockchain finance funding has played, and uh, I would like to give you some context also. Uh, in Japan case. Uh, the missing, the missing middle phenomenon is really very visible with microfinance institutions only focusing on small borrowers with a group based methodology and the banks only focusing on the upper level or the big ticket customers. And also there was a very big uh, visible market segment. But unfortunately, uh, neither the banks nor the MFIs were able to serve there so because of different reasons. And from MFI's perspective, which was the partnering financial institution with and under this program, uh, for, for one, they didn't even have uh, the loan product targeting these women entrepreneurs. So they didn't even know what kind of finance these women uh, need because they were very busy addressing these their other target markets that they were serving for so long now. And uh, they were not even knowing what kind of services they need, what size loan they need. Uh, how what, what type of business they are operating and that's one and this, the other one is um, they also did not have the funding so because of that they were also not motivated to go into that market obviously going into that uh, medium small and medium enterprise financing is, is a substantial amount of liquidity which they did not have uh, but even if they had the funding they didn't even have the product to sell those target markets also and there was information gap uh, in the market because the women also they were not expecting to get this kind of services from the MFIs because they are aware that they are only focusing on very small micro businesses, not the, so the relatively bigger size alone. So there was also a disconnect between the MFIs and the target market. So what this this program did is the kind of bridging those gaps so that those market information through promotions. And letting the women know that okay now this kind of program is available you can get relatively bigger loans and but when they come in they also had their other challenges like for instance the collateral aspect of it even if they wanted to take the loan uh, the, the mfi is uh, learning from the commercial banks we're asking really bigger collateral coverage like 100 percent 300 percent coverage and the women did not have that so our program uh, supports the micro financial institutions so somehow address this challenge by, by introducing what is called the cash flow based lending, where the MFI is encouraged to lend to these women entrepreneurs uh, by focusing on the cash flow generating capacity of the businesses rather than focusing on physical collateral. And we succeeded in, in reducing the collateral coverage requirements from 200 plus percentage to 100 percent and with some MFI even lower. So that attracted women and through the word of mouth kind of promotion. So the service was expanding. And what is very interesting is, uh, apart from the funding that these MFIs are getting from the credit line, they have now convinced that this is really a very profitable business I mean, segment 
that they have started investing their own funding from their scarce resources. So this funding have created a stimulating, mar uh, a catalyzing effect in the market where it somehow stimulated the market to function better, where the, the, the women are now coming to the financial institutions and the financial institutions have now the products to sell those target markets in a better way. Yeah, this is very interesting. This is what is called sometimes the demonstration effect and uh, or the pioneering effect. I, I remember discussing uh, some years ago already with a with a banker uh, with a bank in in Tanzania uh, that is supported also by uh, by the EIB, and they were telling me how successful their lending to to women entrepreneurs was. And then when I asked them, why did you do that? They said, well, it was before, it was not because I think of the EIB, they had initial support by another uh, multilateral uh, bank, but they were saying that was a conditionality. And so that's why they entered in order to get the credit line, there was a conditionality. So they agreed to do it. And then by doing it, they discovered that it was extremely profitable. It sounds to be a bit the same kind of uh, elements. And, and then I'm also, so if you allow me perhaps to, to turn to these kind of, uh, of dimensions and uh, also in terms of the approach that is taken. Sometimes I wonder if it's beyond the direct credit line that is provided to support a very specific group of people. If it's not just the process of empowering the financial institutions and of doing this demonstration effect, that is in fact the most important. And But that is often not captured by the immediate monitoring uh, tools of the uh, development uh, finance uh, institutions, no? Maria? I, I, I do think we capture it. Eh? You know, in our, in our impact assessment, which we do ex ante, and then we monitor and we report on it, we do capture this intangible element. Let, let me give a different example. Uh, you know, the, the loans for women entrepreneurs are a, a, a key way in which you can create incentives and provide technical assistance to make sure that this policy, because in the end it's about, you know, it's policy first, is what is the policy outcome that we want to achieve. But a different example is in the agricultural sector. If you look at commercial banks in Africa in particular, they tend not to be keen to lend to the agricultural sector, while the agricultural sector is the most employment generating sector in Africa. So, how can you create incentives for banks to lend more to agricultural companies and across the whole value chain? So not only the producers. And here in, in a program together with the European Commission in the original EFSD, not in EFSD plus because we, we have not started with this, with this yet, we got the capacity to provide risk sharing. So a bank, and I'm going to be very specific in, in, in Malawi or in Zambia, would get a line of credit from the EIB and thanks to the fact that we get backing from the Commission, we will give them a guarantee alongside our line of credit. And we tell them, you have to use this line of credit for agricultural companies. And we will share in the losses if you incur losses with these companies. We, we share a portion. So there is a risk sharing between the bank and the, the EIB in this case. And we also accompany it with technical assistance so that they're better equipped to analyze the risks of agricultural companies and build a portfolio. Once they build a portfolio, they realize that they were not riskier than other sectors. And then in the future, and that's the point that you were coming to, in the future, yes. they will not so much need the risk sharing because by then they will have built up the experience. So there are financial instruments, and that's what the, the European Commission is trying to put in place with these guarantees that uh, Lucas was presenting, there's ways in which you can create incentives for the private sector. And that's why I was saying it's very unfair to say the private sector is bad. The private sector is as good or as bad as individuals are, and we're all good and bad in different ways. But the private sector is creating jobs, and the private sector can support those areas that are job creating and can learn. And that's where we can help them, giving them incentives to go to achieve policy objectives. That's where an intervention by a public bank like us starts to make sense. Okay, and, and before I move to, to Lucas, perhaps let me get back to also an initial, I mean, to the comment that Valeria was uh, uh, making about, you know, the need to to aggregate and, and, and to scale up the, the, the kind of activities. And at the beginning of our, 
uh, of our meeting, uh, you were saying that the EIB is asked to have more impact, but not to have more volume. Is that not, in a sense, a contradiction if we're looking for ways to scale up? Shouldn't we ask, uh, and I know you're not the shareholder of the, of the EIB, but shouldn't we ask the EIB to not only have more impact, but to also have a higher volume and to be able to be an aggregator uh, to have this bigger impact? And then I'll turn to Lucas with the same question. Shouldn't we empower not just the EIB, but also all the development finance or institutions at the European level to aggregate and, and to have this aggregation ability and perhaps working better together to have to be able to scale up and combining with the uh, activities of the, you know, through grants and other means, policy dialogues and so on to complement uh, what, what they are doing. Maria first at the EIB, shouldn't you also be are you not going the cheap way by saying we'll have more impact, but we will not have more volume when yes. the needs are so big at the time of the COVID uh, crisis? Yes, the thing is, even with a bigger volume, we would not be able to cover all those needs. So, uh, yeah. the key is no, no, but what I mean is the key is in crowding in. So, probably the key, and Valeria would agree with me if she was still online, is in doing less, but facilitating that others do more. That's where we can make a big difference. So, can we really do more with uh, so much more with less? I mean, I agree with your point of the need to crowd in, but if we look at the numbers uh, suggested, you know, for EFSD or FSD plus, it's a it's a le leveraging of the of eight times or something. But we know in practice it's quite difficult, in particular in poorer countries. So, yes, we you want to crowd in, but shouldn't you try to crowd in at with you know larger ambitions for your crowding in? The, the thing is, what, I, what we should do is try to crowd in instead in 10 projects in 100 projects, because then the multiplier effect is much, much bigger. In that sense, yes. But it is, it is not about what we do. It's about what overall we facilitate in terms of new, sustainable and inclusive investments. So it's, it's not about the volume of what I lend. It's about how my lending is facilitating or a creating additional investments be it by the private sector or the public sector. And when we are talking about public sector, you, you probably have heard me many times, what I always say is what we do is enabling investments. For example, you know, without energy, without electricity, the private sector cannot thrive. We cannot say we want a stronger industrial sector because industry will need power. So supporting renewable energy generation and then transmission and distribution is the type of investments that have a very wide multiplier effect. If, if you are supporting the roads that will allow access to markets for, for these agricultural entrepreneurs that I was mentioning, there you're also having a big impact. So it's in that facilitating that others can thrive that we can make a difference. Because with our lending alone, even though you know, it's big amounts, eh, it still never will be enough. So it's facilitating yeah. the that financing of funds. That we know. Thanks a lot. You, uh, Jürgen uh, Hohmann asked a lot of very good questions, but just at the end of the meeting and not uh, not early on, but perhaps Lucas, if you can, I'm not sure we have time to address the SDR question, uh, which is in itself a whole uh, new question. Happy to engage bilaterally uh, on this, but uh, perhaps on the social uh, dimension also, there is this need to, to say to invest more on the social level. Uh, Lucas also has concluding uh, remarks. Sure, sure, thank you. And many thanks to everybody who for, for the very good comments uh, in, in, in the chat. Now, first, uh, first, uh, I, I really concur with Maria on, on, on what she was saying, that it's it's about using very well the, the, capacity, the financial capacity we will have. And then if in a couple of years we are able to show to our member states that you know, the Commission is, is, is on track in using the 40 billion guarantee capacity that they mentioned, if we are using, using it for, for excellent investment programs that achieve a lot of crowding in and not crowding out, then maybe in a couple of years, uh, you member states will decide to 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 increase this further. But let's 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 for in the meantime try to make sure that, that we use every every single euro uh, well. In, for us, it's the guarantee capacity for the EAB and other other development banks. It's it's uh, the loans and, and other financial products that they will provide with our backing. On Jurgen's question, which is excellent, I indeed it's good to point out that under the EFSD plus. 
I mean, some of the guarantees we will be deploying, some of the some of the risk sharing will be will be going for interventions like like Keno has described. So, reducing the collateral require, helping to reduce the collateral requirements uh, of of the local banks, tackling that kind of problems of financial inclusion. But uh, I mean, we also guarantee the EIB's uh, public sector lending, and and in the last two years, the EIB has done a lot of lot of loans loans for public health uh, all over the world. Medical equipment, uh, not on. I mean, the EIB of course does does a lot of lending for the long term investments like like uh, hospital infrastructure. But in response to COVID, the EIB has also also lent for medical equipment, even for vaccine rollout in in a number of countries. So this is also an important and integral part of the, of the EFSD plus. So we really will be will be using these guarantees to cover the full spectrum of the of the development needs. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, sorry, I think I had some connection uh, problem just at the end. So probably indicating that uh, it's perhaps a connection uh, hoops at the uh, quarter past uh, the hour to indicate that we, we are at the end of our discussion. So thank you very much for uh, for, for really your enlightening uh, comments. And, and we see that, you know, moving from the principles to the practice is not always easy, And uh, but I really enjoy the fact that you you, know, you could combine the different expertise and, and, and the goodwill also moving forward. Thanks a lot for all the, the, the questions and also I did not mention them, but uh, very interesting remarks in the, in, in the chat. And uh, we will continue uh, this uh, next year. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I wish you a very good uh, end of the day and a very uh, festive uh, end of the year as well. And uh, be safe. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. And let me also thank again my colleagues at ETDPM and my friends at uh, DAI also for this series of uh, these meetings. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. Thank you, Keno. And thank you, Dr. Maria. Thank you all. Thanks to you. Sandra. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas to everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.